All right. So we will get started. Just as a quick reminder, um, Monica, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, we've we've hit on all these pieces, right? Uh, you know, Hopefully, we've talked about right? empathy. Yep, <laughs> we're good. We've talked about empathy. We've talked about problem definitions. We started with prototype. Uh, it's important to remember you can do this is not a linear process. Uh, but at some point, as you enter, go through this process, you will have come up with solutions to problems. And what today's session is largely about is how do you tell, talk about that? How do you tell your story? And so without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn it over to you, Monica, and uh, we can get into the nitty gritty of this storytelling. I like when I get to be a student instead of a teacher, so I will now become a student. Okay, not for too long. I'm going to make you teach at the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, Scott, did that switch to the next slide? How about that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, like we've talked about throughout this entire process for design thinking, um, everything is fluid, right? So, we revisit lots of the steps multiple times, um, sometimes maybe more than you would like to. Um, it's part of really figuring out all of the different possible solutions. And so as we do that, we're able to really stay open, stay creative, invite in new perspectives, and really think outside the box. So that continues as we start to think about how we're going to tell our message, how we're going to tell our story of what we have discovered throughout this whole process. So as you're putting it together, there's some things to think about as you're putting your message together. So you want to think about the interviews that you did, um, the data you've gathered, those trials and errors through the prototyping process, your beta testing process, um, and try to stay in the, the mindset of the people who you're creating this for. So it's really important to think back to what we initially asked ourselves. So when we start out at the beginning and we think about a problem and what the possible solution would be, and then we go through the entire process of gathering that research um, and coming up with ideas and really putting ourselves in other people's shoes, we want to hold on to that as we are creating our message around the end product. So you don't want to lose all of that, those details of the human story. You really want to hang on to those as much as you can. So remember that the purpose of the whole design thinking process and the whole purpose of what it is that you're creating is about that human experience. So there are lots of ways that you can represent that and engage people in a meaningful way. So the goal is to convincingly but accurately inform key stakeholders, so both within your organization and potentially in the community about what you're doing and why it's important and how you're going to go about that. So sharing data is obviously very valuable, um, but it's not the only way. So you can have data points, you can have hard stats, you can have figures, those can all be really impactful. Um, but there are other things that can help bring people along with your story if you really do connect to that, that human story. So there's lots of different ways, oops, sorry. There's lots of different ways to tell your story, to paint a picture, right? So like I said, you might have a lot of, a lot of data points. Um, you might have a fancy visual. You might have some charts and graphs that you want to use. All of those things can be impactful, but it depends on the audience. It depends on the content that you have um, created and gathered. And it depends on what the story is that you're trying to tell. So even if you do have some sort of fancy visual of some kind, um, that's fantastic, but it still needs context. And it still needs that, that picture painted around it. And then the other option is that you don't have any visuals or graphics or anything like that. And you might just get up and be telling your story. So stories help people feel connected to your message, and that's really what you want. You really want people to come along with you, whether it be the people within your organization that are um, working with you on it or maybe advocates 
of the program or the product or the service that you're creating. Um, or it might be community partners who are going to partner with you in a different kind of way. Um, or it could be the community members themselves or the recipients of whatever it is that you're creating. But likely at some point, regardless of what your platform is, regardless of what your format is for sharing the message around what you created and helping people to understand what it is, at some point, you're probably going to have to speak to it. So you're probably going to have some sort of presentation or talk um, to speak to any sort of report or data. So it's important to think about what that message and what that story might be. So a lot of people ask um, about reports and what reports should look like or what a presentation should look like. And there's a lot of information out there on those things. So I can cover a few things with you today, but there are endless resources out there on the quote unquote correct way to present something or the correct way to report something. But I think for the purposes of the design thinking process that brought you to this point and also the nature of nonprofit organizations is that really starting with that why of what you created and really staying focused on that human connection and the purpose and the meaning behind what you're doing it should really drive your choices in terms of how you're going to present something. So there's lots of ways to vocalize a story. You can have firsthand accounts share their experience and the needs they're facing to help illustrate um, why you created what you created. So that could look like a group of people, like a panel of people that you interviewed throughout your process, um, or some community partners. You could bring them along. Um, Let's say you're presenting to an internal stakeholder group and you want to bring some people in from the community who will be experiencing this and speak to their experience so far. But you could also just tell the story in a true storytelling fashion. Just get up with your message and talk about why it's important and the steps that you took and why you plan to move forward with it. There are lots of other options too. You can do um, video vignettes. You can put together like a little video montage of interviews and um, highlight aspects of the product, of the community, things like that. So there's, again, there's lots of different ways to go about it, but ultimately you're going to want to share your story um, verbally. You're going to want to be able to speak to that message on a continual basis and likely to lots of different groups of people. So speaking of the people and the stakeholders, so if we think about who our stakeholders are, lots of organizations have determined stakeholders to some degree, like they're outlined in your strategic plans. Um, sometimes people talk about different groups that they, they need and want to check in with that are important to the development of their organization and the programs within it. Um, but if you think a little more broadly and think about stakeholders, as just like with all pieces of the design thinking process, if you think outside the box in terms of what stakeholders are, you can start to think about those in the community that might be impacted that maybe weren't necessarily a part of your plan or your study or your research, um, but then you can certainly include those people as well. You can think about the people in your organization who may not be directly involved with what you're creating, but maybe they would be great advocates for it or have great ideas around the development and implementation of it um, ongoing. So think about those stakeholders, both internally within your organization and externally, and what that could look like. And then think about how you're going to position your message to them. So we want to be transparent and accurate in the message that we share. It's not that we're trying to adjust our message so much so to each group that it's radically changing. Um, in some cases, you need those messages to be the same so that everybody kind of hears the same information. But it is important to think about, if you can, tailoring your message to the different groups that you're speaking to about what it is that you're doing so that they can really connect to it in a meaningful way for their place in it. So sometimes this means that different data points might be used. Um, and how you're talking about things. Some people, you know, some groups need a lot of data around something that's more operational, um, and others may not. Others may want to know what the bigger picture is. They just may want to be involved um, from a volunteerism aspect or from recruiting volunteers. So there's different reasons for speaking 
to groups in different ways. Um, but again, it doesn't mean that the information or the facts are different, but just the format, just the format and how you're going about it. You still want accuracy and transparency in your process and in the research that you found, um, but you just might want to craft it in a particular way that resonates with that particular audience. Okay, so today especially, but every time we've talked about every step of the design thinking process, it's all about empathetic listening and the ethnographic research style and really that human-centric design. So those human stories are really at the core. Ultimately, the human story is really the biggest part of what your message is going to be. So as much as moving and as much as data is important, um, data can take on many forms, as we've talked about. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't have some relevant data points to something, but within the context of the story. So one group that's really interesting um, that, the, that is great at storytelling is the Moss in New York. So it's a company in New York where people share personal lived experiences to a live audience. The stories are wide ranging, the concept is the same, it's authentic and personal. And so obviously the moth has a different purpose than sharing about your design process. That's definitely not what they're doing. Um, they are just sharing lived experiences from a performance art standpoint, essentially. But there is some value in learning from their storytelling process because they're certainly experts about it. So the moth suggests that the following to storytellers, and I'll share this with you. The stakes are essential in storytelling. What do you stand to gain or lose? Why is what happens in the story important to you? If you can't answer this, then think of a different story. So for my reason for sharing this is that the perspective that Moss has, this famous institution for storytellers, they share their candid and very personal stories in a raw way, and I think that that's something that can be borrowed when you're talking about the story you're trying to share with the data that you've gathered, which is often very personal um, and very centered around human lives. So there are relatable qualities there, and those relatable qualities are what people connect to and can really believe in and get behind. So it's important to have both, the importance of the data and the facts but then also that context of the human lived experience. So like we said, there may be reports to visualizations, but at some point you'll have to verbalize it. So this is just an important thing to keep in mind as you are sharing that story. Think about what are the stakes for your organization, for this particular product, for this particular service that you've created. Certainly there were stakes when you set out at the beginning and you thought about a need that you saw that your, that your organization and your community could fill. Think about the stakes of the staff time, the resources invested. Um, think about all those things as you are sharing that message. So as you are putting together your story, there are some things to think about as you're pulling it together. So you want to think about what new insights are we trying to offer? So you definitely want to communicate what's different and what's new. We talked a couple times ago about the now, wow, how matrix, and you think about where you place things that you can do now, what are things that are slightly more innovative potentially that can elevate the core of what you're doing, what are some things to hold on to for later and be working toward. So that insight into what we're trying to do, not only just today, but what's the longer term goal? because at some point you really want to reach for those things that are super innovative. Um, that's one of the benefits of going through the design thinking process is you did tap into all that creativity and all those different perspectives. So you wanna be able to share about that. You wanna ask yourself, why did we start this process in the first place and what was our goal? So going back to kind of those stakes and asking yourself, what are the stakes of what we're doing? Why is this important? Um, you wanna go back to that and think about that initial feeling, that, those initial ideas. And then, as we said at the beginning, it's such a fluid process that in design thinking, you're going to revisit all of those steps so many times. But by the time you get to the end of your process and you're ready to share your message, some of those things might be kind of buried in your brain. 
Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot you're thinking about. Oftentimes you're doing it at the same time you're doing a million other things too. And so some things, some details get lost. And it's important, I think, to go back and revisit some of those stories through your research, some of those details, and again, help get you back into that mindset of what was our initial goal and where have we come from from there. It may look very similar or it may have um, evolved a lot along the way. You want to ask what did we create and what did we experience along the way? Think about the feedback throughout the process because certainly that was an important part and you want to be able to communi communicate that to stakeholders. And then definitely include data, any important interview, um, commentary, steps, anything that will be supportive in sh sharing what your decision-making process was as you came to your creation. And then it's always good to talk about next steps. What's needed? Is there a call to action of some kind, whether it be with the people within your organization and your colleagues um, or the community more broadly? So like I said, this can often be a report. It can be um, something that's shared online. But what's always the case is you always end up needing to have a conversation about it, speak to it, um, or speak to a larger group about it. And so having that message or that story, not only in the context of perhaps a report, but something that you can really share that's meaningful and that you can really connect to will help bring others along to connect to it also. So just as a point of reference, it's certainly what you're doing does not need to be a TED Talk. But a TED Talk is a really interesting thing to think about because of the, the choices that they make within that. And so this is all about making choices about how you're going to share your message. And in a TED Talk, a TED Talk is 18 minutes long, and that link was chosen specifically because of research they did around neuroscience and all sorts of very smart things. But they understood that 18 minutes um, was long enough for somebody to really share a concept, um, but short enough that people could digest it and not be overwhelmed. So that's just a good example of thinking about who your audience is, thinking about what's needed, um, and making sure that you have some sort of context to it that really moves that story from start to finish. Okay. So there are lots of questions. Oh, sorry. There's lots of questions to ask yourself as you go along in the process. And this might be something that you ask yourself earlier in the process, but you should definitely check in with yourself at the end. So as you've created your messaging, as you've created your story, you've pulled all of your data together, you have your prototype, it's been tested, you're ready to implement, and you want to share what that all means and what that looks like and what your hope is for that, you need to think about how might this be challenging? If, and maybe it won't be. And I don't necessarily mean the creation itself, um, because you've definitely been through the process to kind of see what the different challenges of the actual product or program or service might be. But I'm speaking more to what might be some challenges in your messaging. So you might come up against some questions or some pushback um, depending on certain ways that you went about it, certain choices that you made. You may not. But these are things to think about as you are putting your message together and preparing to share it out with people. You'll likely get very different questions from internal stakeholders versus external stakeholders. And so those are things to think about how you can be ready for that so that you can really maintain that connection. Obviously, you've done all of this work around it, and it's feeling um, you're very invested in it, and it's very important that it launch and be successful. And so in order to do that, you really do want everybody to come along. So thinking ahead of time about what some of those hurdles might be can be helpful. So I've been talking for a long time. Um, I'm going to let Scott jump in and talk a little bit about what some of those hurdles might be and also just kind of broadly some of the points that we covered. Well, and, and I think one of the hurdles already was asked in a question by Jerry, and, and I will I would like you to weigh in on it, at, at, um, Monica, too, which is, you know, we operate in a space, unlike the moth, where a lot of people are telling personal stories, meaning about themselves, first-person accounts. Um, one of the hurdles we and an ethical issue we have to deal with in the nonprofit sector is anonymity and protection, uh, confidentiality of the people that we're, we're engaging with. 
Um, and I think it, we can easily say you can change the name, but I actually think you have to go further than that. Um, and I think, so when you deal with sensitivity of the individual and protecting the safety of the individual's reputation, personal story, things along those lines, I think you have to get good at putting together kind of uh, what, I, what I would call representative individuals as you tell your story, right? Uh, politicians are particularly good at this. Uh, but it's when you talk about, you might say, so I'm going to tell you about a conversation I had with Jerry and Jerry and, but Jerry's really four people, right? Um, that, that share a similar kind of background and story and things like that. So not only are you changing the name, you're actually also putting together pieces of multiple stories that have a theme to them. I don't, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on that real quick, Monica, and I'll, I'll continue to talk about some other hurdles. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, it goes back to, we talked a few sessions ago about doing um, profiles and a gallery walk. So you look at the people that you interviewed and you think about aspects of them. And you're really what you're doing is you're thinking about the collective group that'll be the recipients of what you're creating. And you kind of segment out like, okay, there's this kind of person's life, um, life experience that's occurring within that. And that's representative of a handful of people who are also experiencing that to some degree, no two humans are the same, but generally um, it kind of gives you a nice overview of what you could think about. And you do that for the, the groups of people that you're trying to reach out to. And so that's one way to talk about those stories. You will often come up against the need for anonymity. Not always, not always 100% of the time. You sometimes will have people who are willing to really be a part of the process and speak their story, and that can be really powerful. Um, but if you do need to maintain anonymity, which is often the case, those are tactics that you can do. So when, you, when I reference talking about the personal and the lived experience, that's definitely not to call any certain person out, but rather to share that experience um, in as anonymous way as possible and still benefit in the message by having it included. Yeah, I, I think some of the other hurdles that you're going to see uh, that we all deal with, I, I am not immune from this either, is avoiding jargon, right? This is, this is plain spoken language. Uh, this is this is for the population, not for insiders, right? So I, again, I, I, I talk about the people I see on my screen. My friend Susan Wally is on here. She's in education space. You, you know, if you're talking about education, you don't want to be jargony about the inside baseball of education. That's not the point of this. It's not clinical. It's narrative um, to me. And that's the whole design process. I think that's why this fits so well. And, and what Monica's contribution is a nice addition to what I've seen out there on design thinking. It's because as we can, the whole spirit of this is giving voice to people who don't typically have voice. And it's their voice, it's not your voice as the researcher per se, you're just trying to, um, so you don't wanna add in the jargon, right? You don't wanna add in the professional education jargon. You want it to be, what are their pain points? What are their insights? What are their needs? What is the context of their life experience, their lived experience? Um, and so that, so her, when I think of hurdles for, for people like me and other professionals in the nonprofit sector, I think one of the biggest ones going to be, how do you not make it sound like you're at a professional presentation at a conference? How do you, how do you make it correspond so that it is human and, and, and personal immediately? The last thing I'd say from a, from a hurdle perspective, and this is something I've worked very hard on over the years and I, I need to get better at it is authenticity in, in sharing these, these stories, writing from an authentic perspective. Uh, we're so trained because of people like me who've been your teachers over the years, we've trained you to write clinically. Uh, what we're asking you to do with something here is to write authentically, right? Ab about the authentic experience. And the whole design process is asking you to be authentic and not just count numbers. Um, statistics are great. I love stats, I love data. Um, I love quantitative data, but they don't, all, they don't actually tell the full story of what someone's lived experience is. And I think, again, as Monica went through, and I, I think the Moth and Ted are two great examples. Moth is so good. Um, 
because it's really about the authenticity of it. And you see different storytelling techniques and they're all, they can all be equally powerful if they're authentic. Yeah, it's definitely something to borrow from. I would say to the hurdles too, I think that you can avoid some of those challenges or hurdles if you are engaging a variety of people throughout your entire design thinking process. So I think all of those different perspectives advocated throughout design thinking, and we talked a little bit about that previously, about bringing people in to talk about a solution or a problem who wouldn't normally be at that same table, at that same meeting as possible, get the perspective of some people who are going to think outside the box simply because they're not in your sphere every day thinking about these things. So that, that may address some of those hurdles or those questions from people who aren't so connected to it like you are um, earlier in the process. Yeah, Monica, there's a great question I think that's worth you addressing, and it's uh, it was from Leslie, and how do we respectfully present stories without seeming exploitative um, and avoid poverty porn? So I think that the most important thing, and, and Scott just mentioned it, but the authenticity, um, that is very real, and that is very powerful. And so I think if you are coming at it from a perspective of not leveraging a story for your own benefit, but truly sharing the story from a heart space of this is important to what we're doing um, and you believe in that, then I think that you're going to avoid it feeling exploitive, um, but certainly you need to be extra careful about that and make sure that even if you are feeling like you can authentically tell a story, share a story, um, to check yourself and to say, why is this included? How am I including it? Am I the best person to speak to it? Um, is this person okay with that? And just do all of those kind of back to the more clinical, rigorous research checks. Um, this is really going to be when you're messaging what you've worked on, you've done some of that really, that research. And then this is kind of more how the feel of like you're marketing your message to some degree, but it's really sharing your research and so it's that striking that balance between um, being more clinical, but also being super authentic and passionate and invested in what you're doing. So I know that's kind of a, like a non-answer a little bit, but it, it really is about just making sure that you're doing it for the right reasons and the right person is sharing that and then checking yourself against those kind of guidelines. And those might be criteria that you set up before you even start the process. Yeah, let me let me highlight a comment from Jeanette uh, Thomas, who I, I you you kind of read my mind um, from a process standpoint. Make sure that the people you're telling the stories about have an opportunity to hear the stories before they hit the public. I mean, allow them to kind of give feedback, um, not just. And you talked about permission. I think that's a that's that's bare minimum check. But even after you've composed the story, make sure that it captures their their experience in a way that they would want it captured. Uh, other people have suggested having, having the actual individuals tell their stories, I think is a great idea. It's not always feasible for some of the storytelling, but when possible, it's a great idea. Yeah, that's a good opportunity for those um, kind of panelist type approach like we talked about, um, to have some people have experienced a few of those and they are very powerful and the people who come to share their story um, are very invested in sharing their story because they want others to understand what's going on um, in whatever that particular situation is. So that can be a very beneficial um, approach. I would also say that we've talked throughout this six-part series about our my goal for anybody who wants to explore this is to is to have this be embedded in them as a as a strategic orientation as a cultural orientation to how they go about doing their work. And I, and this, if you can do that, I think some of these potential challenges go away because no longer am I trying to come up with the solution for you. I'm using my platform to allow you to help influence the solution for your experience. And, and that may seem semantics, but I don't feel like it is. I, I, I really believe that it's a completely different orientation to how we solve problems, which is using 
the resources that maybe I've been able to collect and, and amalgamate and putting them to use for you based on what you tell us that is your real experience and, and your real barriers. And I think that if we, if we take that orientation to it, it'll come out in our storytelling too. Yeah, and whether you realize it or not, earlier in the process when you're doing some of those, like you're writing down your ideas, um, sticky notes, and you're getting them on the wall, and we talked a lot about like the physicality of really like <clears throat> being in the process in a variety of ways, those things are going to come out through that process, but they wouldn't normally come out if you just sat down to like write a report and think about it in a way that even if you don't realize you're doing it, I know I do this, if I were to go about it this way, you start to write something out or think about a problem the way you think it should sound or the way you think it should be solved. So the design thinking process helps to break that up and open up your mind to different ways of looking at things. So by the time you have gotten to the end, you've maybe addressed a lot of those things already because you've gone about it in such a different way than you normally might. Yeah, and uh, Jeanette's on a roll today. Sorry to keep going out. Uh, uh, the, there is power imbalance. And, and again, uh, I'm not saying this is an easy solution, but I think we should be working towards minimizing those. You know, we talk oftentimes in the sector, all sectors, about diversity and why it's important and, and creating diverse environments. And if we don't, if we, if we wait, and then say we're going to tell stories and then we bring people in the power imbalances are going to be strong and they're going to be very solid we should be trying to break those down now we should be creating structures and processes for our clients to engage in in a governance fashion maybe not uh, the uh, policies and procedures and everything of the organization but should be have a say in in our organizations at a very early stage um, those are the things we need to be doing alongside this work uh, because when we have real relationships with the people we work with and for, then we can then we don't have to be subject to the power imbalances that take place when we do these things artificially, or process, that, that just have a very clinical process to them. Uh, Lauren from Innovate Her has a question. Um, Often the data and story have to intersect all in the same presentation. I'll give an example. You seek a corporate partnership and the indiv individual you're talking with is all in because they believe in your cause. But then they have to go back and answer to their funding stakeholders. How can you craft messages in a way that speaks to both, knowing how to balance the two? I'm, I'm not touching that one, Monica. That's all you <laughs> That's my favorite kind, because then you get to do both. So that's how I look at it. Um, I think that if you have if you have data, if you have statistics, if you have raw figures um, that are really impactful, that really do kind of move the needle in terms of you share them and it really shows something, I think that that can benefit your story and vice versa. You have that and you speak to the context and it gives kind of an aha of like, oh, well, okay, so I see why that figure or that number is what it is. Um, so I, I would not say that it has to be one or the other. Sometimes you have to make the choice um, based on the audience or based on the information that you have or the time that you're given to present. You can only do so much in one space. Um, but if you are able to have both, I think that that's fantastic and can be very powerful, um, especially depending on that audience member and what they really need to gain out of it. So if you feel like you have that human story and they are bought in, but I would say that's actually the harder part sometimes. So I think that's fantastic. And then if you have done your homework and you have your research, you have your data, and you can share that in a meaningful way, the two just will strengthen each other. So I think it's great to do both when you can. I do also always offer to go with if I've convinced one person in the process and they think there's going to be a barrier, I'm always happy to offer to go with and help tell the story to um, not ask them to carry all the water by themselves. Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. Uh, there's a question about mind mapping. Uh, I candidly am not familiar with mind mapping. Monica, I don't know if you are. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's not a process that I personally um, use all that often, but I'm a little familiar with it. Um, what is what is the question around mind mapping? Well, it's more of a statement. It says mind map. It says mind mapping is a helpful tool for seeing all the aspects and their connections. Um, do we have any comments about the mind map? Yeah, I mean, I would say you know back to kind of the different tactics that we talked about in terms of thinking about what the problem is, I think that you can go about thinking about what your message is in a similar fashion. So whatever helps you to kind of collect and make your message cohesive, if that is putting things up on a whiteboard, if that is sticky notes, um, if that's mind mapping, I think all of those things are really helpful to get it down on the page. I personally am a journaler, Scott, don't laugh. And so I, I like to write things out. I like to see what like the emotion behind things is. Um, and then that helps me then move forward to the next process. So I think if mind mapping helps you to kind of sort out and organize what the areas are, I think that that's a great way to go about it. And like I said, it might be um, beneficial both at the kind of thinking about what the problem is. It might be beneficial then when you bring your research back. And then again, as you're building your message, if that's truly a, a strategy that works for you. Uh Robin has a has a question about how we um, how does the audience wrap a design project in a project evaluation framework, including with a theory of change and a logic model. How do you balance the need for clinical narration with external authentic narration? Yes, yeah, so I think this goes back to um, kind of what we talked about in terms of like everything that's needed in your presentation. Think about your audience. So there may be one particular audience that you need to present to or speak to that needs to, you need to tie all of those things together. And that is going to take some, organ some more heightened organization around your message so that you can be sure you're speaking to your logic models, your outline, um, strategic initiatives, those sorts of things. You want to make sure that you're including um, outcomes and outputs and things that really need to be spoken to for the importance of what that audience needs to hear and understand. Um, you can still absolutely infuse and should the human story into that. It really is the driving purpose behind what you're doing. So the other things make it possible potentially from a funding standpoint um, or from a logistics standpoint. And so all of those things can be intertwined. It's just going to take more organization um, to pull that message together. But it seems too about what's maybe not needed. Sometimes I, I think people feel like a lot is needed, um, but really look to see what's being asked of you and make sure you're not adding anything else in that's really not necessary. Like don't overcomplicate it, which I am way guilty of sometimes. But if, um, if, it, if it begs for simplicity, it's okay to go that route too. So I would just like really take a hard look at what is needed and not add anything that isn't or might confuse things. So uh, I apologize. We've gone a little long on this part of the section, but it was great questions and I didn't want to cut the conversation short. This is the time where if you want to stay and talk about storytelling in smaller groups, please do. If you, if you need to hop off, um, go ahead and do that right now too. I give a couple minutes for that to happen. Uh, again, thank you for being a part of we tried something new. We tried to do a six-part series. Uh, hopefully, some of you, you all found some utility in this in, in your work. Uh, I know some of you just hopped on for the storytelling. Great. We, we designed these to be standalone sessions as well. 